Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another IFC podcast and webinar on the coronavirus. Uh, my name is Gary Ludwig. I'm honored to serve as the president and the chair of the board for the International Association of Fire Chiefs. This is our seventh IFC coronavirus task force webinar. We conduct them as a reminder every Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please go to IAFC.org to register. I want to thank everyone who is joining us this afternoon for this webinar, either directly or later when you will be listening to the recording. The IFC represents the leadership of over 1.2 million firefighters and over 30,000 fire departments in the United States. We also have members in Canada and other countries around the world. Our coronavirus task force is chaired by Chief John Sinclair. John will not be joining us today. He's celebrating his wedding anniversary, and so we wish him and his bride the best. However, the chair of our economic task force is with us today, Chief Steve Pegram. He will be joining us and we'll hear from him later. Those that are also on today's show include Dr. Jim Augustine, and Jim will give us the latest update on medical information uh, that we have related to the coronavirus. Our government affairs director, Ken LaSalle, is also joining us and he'll also update us on the latest, latest legislative efforts going on on Capitol Hill. As I said, Steve Pegram, Chief Steve Pegram is with us. He chairs our economic task force. And one I'm interested in listening to is Chris Rogers, Lieutenant Chris Rogers of the Kirkland, Washington Fire Department. Chris was uh, one of the firefighters who uh, was first into the nursing home that we uh, heard so much about early on, and, um, and he's going to relate to us his experiences. Uh, as a reminder, we are using audio that is being broadcast over voice internet protocol technology. Uh, it's being done through your computers on your speakers, or your computer speakers or your headset. Please make sure your speakers or your headset are turned on and the volume is turned up. Also, if you're experiencing any difficulties, please contact WebEx at the number shown on the screen, which is 866-229-3239. And with that said, I believe we're now going to turn it over to uh, Jim Augustine, Dr. Jim Augustine, who sits on a coronavirus task force. Jim always has the latest updates, which change weekly, almost daily, almost hourly on what's impacting us with this coronavirus. So, Jim, you now have the floor. Chief Ludwig, thank you very much. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, and I just received a note from you, a reminder to all of our members, read to the bottom. Uh, of the notes that come from uh, Chief Ludwig. Um, this has been an eventful week um, in terms of healthcare management uh, related to uh, the coronavirus. Uh, it's fortunately been a week of better news. Um, a couple of ongoing points um, that are really important for Fire EMS uh, to remember in regard to uh, this virus. Uh, pulse oximetry is the best monitor device uh, for determining how sick the patient is. Uh, and what is becoming very evident in the management of large numbers of these patients uh, in the home environment, uh, they become significantly hypoxic uh, without being as symptomatic as one would expect. That is because the hypoxia is occurring over time. Uh, our EMS people, and I had a couple of these surprises this week, um, were, were put the pulse oximeter on the finger of the patient, noted it to be very low, tested it against another pulse oximeter. When another vehicle got there, they tested against another pulse oximeter, and their readings are in the 80s with a patient who uh, is tachypnic uh, but is not otherwise complained of shortness of breath. That is the common presentation of many of these patients once they get into the pulmonary dysfunction mode. Uh, so a reminder of how important the pulse oximeter is, and it is frankly the only device uh, in many situations uh, that is needed to determine how sick the patient is. Still in the station, and when it comes to our workforce, uh, the symptom checking device, so your survey form and a thermometer are the best ways to determine if our members potentially are ill uh, and if they need further investigation in terms of their personal health. Identifying asymptomatic carriers has become more difficult with this virus, um, and uh, we are learning uh, that there may be more and more asymptomatic carriers in the community. As we reopen, that may become more of an issue. Nonetheless, the cases keep decreasing across the country. 
Next slide. The CDC this week um, announced a few new symptoms. If you read through that document of the new symptoms, really not a whole lot that is new in terms of pre-hospital care. Our major symptoms are, are still sore throat, um, a dry cough, shortness of breath, and something that relates to aches and pains that go along with a fever. Our objective uh, findings with the patient, pulse oximeter and the back of your hand or a thermometer for a fever. Uh, the CDC will keep updating this and will include things like GI distress and diarrhea and other things, uh, but we have discovered and put into place already in most of your departments uh, the critical symptoms uh, for coronavirus. Next slide, please. We are worried and noticing uh, the issue related to out-of-hospital cardiac arrests, uh, and the group of large system medical directors, the EAGLES, uh, we have been surveying our own members. Um, in a majority of jurisdictions in this country, and even some from out of this country, uh, out-of-hospital cardiac arrests are increasing, and they have increased at a significant rate and the communities hit hardest by coronavirus. They will continue to be up in many communities. There are a few communities that are flat and a few communities that have decreased their cardiac arrest volumes. The new AHA guide, which is available to all of our departments and all of the healthcare system, was published two weeks ago. It is available from the AHA, or you can send me a note and I'll, I'll forward it to you. Uh, it contains increasing numbers of procedures that can be used to protect our members in doing resuscitation. It also discusses termination of resuscitation uh, and how that can be worked out both with the local medical community uh, your fire EMS medical director and communicated uh, through the community either on the scene uh, or by uh, the healthcare system. Pre-hospital cardiac arrests are likely to increase even at the end of our current wave of patients as the medical care system has been disrupted and people have not been able to get their routine care. There is no doubt a downstream effect of that and that will be notable in many of your communities. Next slide, please. This is uh, about our workforce and about keeping our people safe. Again, the most important thing to deter, the most important element of determining whether people are sick when they arrive uh, for shift or when they arrive for a response, what symptoms are you having, if any, uh, and then a temperature determination. There should be a form available for each of your personnel uh, that relates to their lack of or presence of symptoms and what they are. And oftentimes that symptom chart is what will lead the medical care community or the medical directors like me uh, to determine what kind of testing is needed by your personnel. Also, if they've had an exposure, um, as you know, the CDC uh, loosened their restrictions on quarantine. And in many cases, unless it's a very high risk exposure, uh, the healthcare worker who's essential for, for uh, the community, uh, that healthcare worker is going back to work and doing self monitoring and a twice a day temperature determination. Only if that begins to trigger, will that person need to move into isolation, uh, testing and further care. Next slide, please. All right, um, we will, we will uh, just do our briefer on testing again. What is new this week is the FDA has allowed an emergency use authorization uh, for a test that involves spitting in a bottle. For those of you who have had the nasal swabs done or the throat swabs, they're not comfortable. Um, and um, spitting into a bottle, so that's clearing your throat and spitting uh, into a bottle uh, to a certain volume uh, is a very good way to wash the virus off of your respiratory tract um, and into a setting where it can be tested for. That testing uh, is at this point believed to be as accurate as the swab test. It will also facilitate in a much easier way home testing. Uh, and so that is a significant addition to our armamentarium looking for the coronavirus. Next slide. We now have the availability of a growing number of serology tests. Uh, those are tests for antibodies, which form against the coronavirus in your blood system. 
There are, there are over 120 uh, companies that have applied to the FDA for approval of their antibody testing. Uh, at this point, only one has been FDA approved. The others are being used under an emergency use authorization. There are a number of fact sheets available uh, and on the slides here uh, and available to you, uh, links are available to both the FDA um, and to the CDC in regard to serologic testing. A important note for you, uh, this testing process is a very, very um, early way of determining whether you have antibodies uh, to the coronavirus or not. We do not know at this point in any way whether this indicates whether you've had immunity form to the coronavirus or not. And you will see a repeated number of documents that have come from the CDC, from the World Health Organization, and from your state departments of health that say, only use these serologic tests to determine the presence of antibodies or not. They cannot be used for decision-making in regard to the use of PPE or how bad the exposure has been to the coronavirus for that individual. There are a number of you who are in programs, and I got my first one today uh, from Atlanta, uh, where two of our counties are doing testing across the community. That is for the numbers of people and the percentage of people uh, that have been exposed to the antibody. It will help determine later uh, needs for vaccination. It cannot be used at this time to determine who is sick right now, who can return to work, and who has immunity or not. Uh, so please be very careful in the implementation of any kind of testing as part of a public health project. It may be a very good idea as to part of only a department use of this just to determine who has antibodies or not. Um, it doesn't give you any decision-making, uh, Chiefs, that, that will not help you. Next slide, please. Those tests typically involve a drop of blood on a card. Other forms of the test uh, involve drawing of a tube of blood. Uh, the tube of blood will likely contain larger numbers of antibodies um, and likely will be uh, the long-term way that de we determine uh, the application of antibody testing, just so everyone is aware. Next slide. Again, there will be a graph. Uh, that will show you over time uh, about the presence of antibodies and how it relates to when the infection occurred. Uh, there is a gap between the time that you are exposed to anything and your blood system builds antibodies. In other diseases, that's about two weeks. Um, and it's important that we understand serology for diseases like hepatitis and measles and other things that we use for decision-making in the service are not at that point yet in the use of these tests in the coronavirus. And on this slide, I also remind you, we have had individuals who have had persistent positive tests on the swab testing done in people's noses. We do not know how at this point to interpret what those persistent positive tests might mean in terms of contagiousness of that individual, either in the station or at home. Uh, or if we have, with this virus, uh, the potential for a carrier state. So that will be a quandary. And it seems many departments with enough members have had one person who got ill, they got better, they had another test done to clear them to go back to work or to donate plasma, and that test is positive. Um, that is a situation, again, we do not know how at this point to, de to uh, determine. Uh, what their long-term might be. Uh, we know at this point that that potentially means that they're contagious or infectious, and we'll have to take ongoing precautions around their family, the community, uh, and are likely not a good candidate to come back to work. That is part of the current CDC guidelines. Next slide. Our next challenge and what the task force will be dealing with over the next couple of weeks is how the Fire EMS Service will contribute to the reopening of America and, and uh, to the world. Uh, those are very important steps. We have a number of documents that are coming out. Uh, you should use the documents available at the federal level, at the state level, and then at the local level. 
um, and you will have to be active in determining uh, what your actions need to be as we reopen. Next slide. Some of those elements include how the department will be involved uh, in monitoring situations that are going on across the globe. What we are concerned about uh, is there is a potential for a second wave of illness so that even over the next couple of months, if we begin to see significant reductions in patients in America, uh, significant reduction in hospitalizations and deaths, that there still could be the spread of this uh, virus across the globe. So the public health officials will begin to look very carefully at what is going on in the southern hemisphere of the globe. Uh, if they see uh, in, that, in that community um, ongoing spread of the virus, uh, there is a greater likelihood that then when cold weather arrives back in the northern hemisphere, that the virus will reappear. It will also in the fall in this country be mixed with influenza and our other common winter diseases. That will be a much more difficult situation uh, for us to move through. Uh, it also means um, oftentimes second waves are worse than the first wave and it's potential that we could have to shut back down again. Therefore, it makes our window of opportunity and our work with Gary Ludwig and other members of the IFC planning group, uh, the economic task force, we will have a lot of work to do in this window uh, where we can address care, we can address our communities, we can address our PPE, we can address our finances, we can address our testing mechanisms and our way of containing it should it begin to occur again uh, this fall. Um, and we will continue to look for development of a vaccine. At this point, uh, the numbers look like this. Uh, there are 60 vaccines that are currently under development across the globe. There are five of them that, had moved, that have moved uh, into trials. Um, there is a need for us to move through a very significant planning process about how we will apply the vaccine, both in this country and across the globe. And of course, it is across the globe that is the long-term solution to coronaviruses. It will be important for you as fire EMS leaders to determine how and where you will be involved in the process of both testing and vaccinations. And you will need to work with the rest of the public health in the hospital and healthcare communities um, in your world uh, to make sure that you are a participant in this. There will be first um, an attempt at large scale vaccinations should we find one that is safe and effective. Uh, you may want to be part of that as a number of our departments were in the H1N1 uh, flu uh, event 2009 and uh, most of our state EMS agencies approve the use of our people to deliver vaccinations under a fixed protocol and in concert with public health. Uh, that may be the situation again uh, when the vaccination comes available. We also may be particularly be needed uh, to deliver vaccinations and testing to situations where patients and persons cannot get out very easily. Uh, so that will be our, our heavy needs communities um, and you should discuss this with your public health and your healthcare officials. I appreciate the opportunity to present. We're turning the corner on this, at least through its first wave. Over the next couple of weeks, we will have more planning to do, and particularly related to uh, our window environment here and how IAFC and Gary and C. Pegram and others uh, will be leading us through that. Uh, Chief Ludwig, thank you very much, and I will uh, be on for the rest of this and available for questions. Thank you, sir. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, Jim. Again, outstanding information, always timely and relevant. And uh, again, it changes weekly. So I encourage you to those that are listening to please join us every Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to hear the latest from Dr. Jim Augustine. Thank you, Jim. Uh, and what Jim made reference to at the beginning is that as we were getting ready to go to the air, um, the IFC issued a mass blast uh, email alert to uh, all our members uh, on a call to arms. We need to contact our Congress representatives in the Senate and in the House 
Uh, you can use the IFC's Legislative Action Center to contact them. It's an easy methodology um, that we need support for $5 billion, the next stimulus bill in the AFG program, and also $5 billion to be put into the SAFER program. I continue to get repeated emails, phone calls, text messages from chiefs that are telling me that their city managers already are preparing for 5, 10, 15, and even 20% layoffs uh, in each department because of the downturn in the economy and the impact on revenue for local government. So uh, this is kind of a good segue. So again, I encourage you to go and uh, you need to um, contact your representatives and please ask them to support the fire service by uh, embracing uh, that type of funding that we need and it's not a one, it's a need inside the EFG and the SAFER programs. So this is a good segue to our government affairs director, which is Ken LaSala, uh, who again storms the steps up on Capitol Hill on our behalf. And so I'm now gonna turn it over to our government affairs relation director, which is Ken LaSala. Ken, you now have the floor. Thanks, Chief Ludwig. I appreciate everybody's time today. Um, my uh, presentation will be uh, fairly short. I just have one slide. Uh, the big thing I'm sure you all heard was from um, the call to action um, that the um, uh, basically, as you heard, uh, we're asking for $5 billion each for the assistance of firefighters grant program and then and also $5 billion for the uh, safer grant program. Um, now, the purpose of this is to do two things. One is to help fire departments now deal with uh, the supply needs that they have and um, also be able to purchase the, the uh, N95 uh, gear, the uh, sanitizing agents uh, and other personal protective equipment and equipment that's needed to uh, protect the fire station and the firefighters. Uh, and then two, um, to start dealing with the personnel costs that are coming from uh, COVID response, including backfill and overtime costs, and then also to um, help fire departments be able to retain and rehire firefighters over the summer when it looks like some layoffs may happen. So uh, one of the things we're doing is also asking for um, Congress to waive some of the requirements, including the cost share, and even look at review, look at uh, um, waiving the peer review process. That way we can actually get funding more quicker to fire departments. So, um, you know, Chief Ludwig, Chief Sinclair, and Chief Pegram have met with um, um, members of the House and Senate Appropriations Committees. They've met with the FEMA Administrator. Uh, they've met with, uh, um, you know, the Assistant Administrator for Grants. They've met with folks over at the White House um, virtually. Um, but really, for this to work, we're really going to need um, members of the IFC to reach out to their senators and representatives and call them about this issue and then also to use our uh, Legislative Action Center. So if you go to the link right there on the page um, mm -hmm. or go to ifc.org slash, slash gr and then go to our Legislative Action Center, you should be able to reach out and uh, contact your member of Congress just with the click of a couple buttons. Getting to the grants perspective, uh, this week we have a lot of good news. Uh, one is the $100 million to the that Congress appropriated for the uh, Assistance to Firefighters Grant Program. The application period starts on April 28th, that's tomorrow, and goes to May 15th. Um, also, uh, the Safer Grant application period from fiscal year 2019 funding, uh, that is now open and will be uh, open also until May 15th. And then those uh, f folks who are gonna be applying for fire prevention and safety grants, uh, the application period just happened today and, uh, and uh, it's gonna stretch from April 27th to May 29th. So that is um, uh, the uh, legislative update. I will let you know, uh, the IFC is looking at some issues regarding HHS. Uh, the um, Department of Health and Human Services is uh, sending money to local fire departments. And then also they'll be opening up a couple of portals for fire departments to be able to apply for funding for um, treating uh, patients who don't have insurance. Um, however, it's kind of a moving process and also uh, kind of complicated. So we're gonna have a blog put up fairly soon which should explain all the information to you. So that's my update. Uh, Chief Ludwig, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Another fine job, Ken, and we appreciate everything you and your staff are doing for us on Capitol Hill. I know it's been a lot of long hours, 
weekends and just uh, just a ton of work, but we appreciate it. And we pray it pays off with uh, the proper funding for the AFG and the SAFER grants and some of the other legislative issues we're trying to get through. Uh, now I'm going to uh, turn the floor over to the chair of our economic task force, which is uh, Chief Steve Pegram. And uh, I'm thankful for Steve and all the work that he has done with his task force of many experts, also subject matter experts, uh, on helping fire departments navigate through this tough economic times. And so, uh, Steve, you now have the floor. I'm getting a lot of choppiness, and I don't know if that's on my end or yours. Um, so glad to be here again, representing the economic task. Beyond Ken's doing a fantastic job as as this pan needs. Uh, AFG has issued a special grant that. Uh, will open tomorrow for applications. The be out there and I would encourage people to read that. This grant is very specific for reimbursement of or future purchase of personal protective equipment. And there is a list of what equipment is uh, authorized under the grant. So this is whole grant. You can items the PPE patient. Uh, so we patient hundred million fire. There's also Ludwig and Hey Steve, can I, hey Steve, can I can I interrupt you just a second? Uh, you're cutting in and out, and it might be your bandwidth. Can you try cutting off your video and see if you can just do the audio? I'm not even. You there, Steve? All right, we might have lost Steve. So uh, if he rejoins us, um, Chris, are you ready to do your presentation, Chris Rogers, Lieutenant Chris Rogers? I sure can. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and start? And if uh, Steve is able to rejoin us, we'll we'll loop him back in. So, uh, uh, Chris, we appreciate you coming on the show today. I know that uh, you were challenged. You were the first case we heard about. Uh, impacting uh, us in the fire service when it came to coronavirus and you and your department, so uh, and you and your fellow firefighters. So you now have the floor and uh, we're curious uh, and excited to hear what uh, transpired with you. Oh, thanks for, thanks for the opportunity to speak to this and stuff. And uh, first of all, thanks for my department for us talking about this. First of all, I want to kind of throw out a correction. I My first response to the COVID patient was actually a patient discharge from Life Care Center at Kirkland the day before. So she tested positive and we were greatly impacted by that response. So go ahead and hit the next slide. You know, a little bit of background on the Kirkland Fire Department. We're uh, surrounded by Lake Washington and Redmond and Bothell and Woodenville with uh, the city of Seattle to the uh, across the lake from us. Uh, our main employer in the region is Microsoft, but oddly enough, our biggest employer in Kirkland is Google. So the first official response that we had for the COVID virus was actually the second day of our 48 hour set on a C shift the 26th of February. And again, like I said before, it was actually a patient that was discharged from a life care center and moved to an adult family home uh, a few hours shortly before we responded. And it was actually an un not an unusual cardiac event, other than the fact that when we first got there, the, the caregiver stated that she was just fine. She was okay. So that, you know, that, that kind of caught us a little concerned, but nothing unusual. We were wearing normal PPE for a cardiac arrest response, which was just um, eye protection gloves. We did not wear uh, masks and we did not wear gloves like we typically did for a cardiac arrest. Uh, needless to say, we were exposed. We were exposed, my crew was exposed 
to the um, the patient. And that was without a doubt. And actually, when we run at the cardiac arrest, we run with a, a ladder, or excuse me, an engine, an aid car, and an ambulance, what we call a medic unit, a battalion chief, and then other, uh, and an EMS supervisor. The next day, which would be a shift, which is, we went around the 4896 shift schedule. Station 21, which is the first two, station two life care center at Kirkland, responded to basically the same patient over and over again. And, and really, a, a huge credit goes to Lieutenant Dick Hughes from uh, from Station 21, to, who identified the problem, identified the pattern, and started addressing the pattern early. And some of the steps he took were uh, passing the information up the chain of command, working with the hospital whenever they transported a patient. And after the fourth or fifth patient, it was identified that the facility had that two people from Life Care Center of Kirkland tested positive for the COVID virus, a healthcare worker and patient who I think died that day. Again, the, 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 the kind of the key takeaways was that it was a, a company officer that identified the problem and set things rolling into action. Um, from then, after the COVID, uh, uh, COVID virus was detected the, at the facility, everybody who responded to that facility was uh, put into quarantine or isolation. Now, the challenge is, is that all of a sudden it took a third of our department out of service right away. And so they took a one station out of service, which was the quarantine station, and they had opened up a facility that was a um, abandoned park shed that had some, apparently had some bedrooms in it that was a quarantine station. Now, the challenge is that, and I got to also give credit to my rookie, um, Firefighter Allen, who checks his email apparently on his day off. <laughs> a lot of us don't check email, but he was uh, checking his email and he noted that, hey, um, there's a lot of a lot of emails going on about the life care center for the coronavirus. And I'm going, well, OK, let me check out about check this out. I got on my email that morning, Saturday morning, looked at it and go, ah, yeah, sounds like we might be a candidate for this as well. So I contact our EMS captain and I go, hey, is this, is this an issue with my crew? And we had a patient that got discharged from Life Care Center, but wasn't at Life Care Center itself. About an hour later, I got a call saying, yes, it, you are an issue and you gotta go to quarantine immediately. And which was a new thing to me. I've never been ordered to go to quarantine and ordered to do anything off duty. And unfortunately, if, um, you can see the next slide. Go ahead. Next slide, please. Uh, unfortunately, we had two days of, of time off, and I was actually in Canada. So I had to negotiate getting back in the United States to move into quarantine. Another challenge is we also had two other members that were out of state as well on vacation. So uh, the two other members that were out of state actually met up with each other, rented a car, met up with each other. I mean, this is also considering the fact that we have little information to go with as far as like how contagious is this virus? What is the risk? Uh, you know, are we passing this off to, off their loved ones? So we immediately, we just, we just as a department, basically just cut contact with everybody we are associated with. Those two guys rented a car, drove across three states and came back to Kirk. So that was kind of a huge challenge as well as like, what do you do with folks that you know, it was easy to quarantine folks that were still on duty and you put them off in isolation or, or quarantine. The, the challenge, what do you do with two folk, with folks that were off for several days? Next slide, please. So, and again, I, you know, this is part of the, you know, since this pandemic is kind of commonplace and we're got, we've gotten kind of used to it and conditioned to it as a society, this probably isn't a big deal if you have responders or uh, neighbors or whomever that have been exposed to the coronavirus or have a coronavirus. So we've gotten kind of used to it, but in this incipient stage of the event, it was a new thing. We didn't know what was going on. We didn't have a lot of information. We weren't sure how contagious or how fatal it is. And there was actually a lot of fear associated with this. So, you know, some of the things is what is the risk or what, you know, what, what is the right information? And also what is the family impact? For me, myself, I had a uh, son that had some respiratory problems, and so that's why I chose I chose to quarantine, actually it turned out isolation at a fire station, uh, which was fire station 21 in Kirkland. And you see in the upper right-hand corner, it kind of presented some interesting challenges since we, Kirkland's not known for being 
a media spotlight. And all of a sudden, we had a lot of media attention that mo- none of us were used to. And so in the upper right-hand corner, you see that's actually me taking a picture of the TV at the fire station of the reporter outside the fire station filming the fire station both be inside the fire station. And so it was presented some interesting challenges, like how do you kind of deal with the media in, in the circumstance? And like, again, as, as a lieutenant, I, I'm, that's kind of below, above my pay grade, how you deal with it. But you know, let's just say presented some challenges. For me to get into that fire station, uh, they had to do a diversion around the media so I can like park my car in the back of the fire station so nobody can see me go in. Also, some of the other unknowns is how contagious or how uh, uh, bad is this disease. And so we did a pretty proactive job in station cleaning. And so in the middle picture, you see a professional cleaning service guy come into the fire station full full PPE to collect everybody's gear that was at that fire station. And then the, finally, uh, we we read we taped the fire station uh, in like an isolation zone around the station. We had a lot of media come in taking pictures and, and the bottom right hand corner was kind of funny. Uh, the person that's in that car was an NPR reporter. The reason I found out about that, she actually got a station phone number and called the fire station. And so uh, I saw her taking pictures from up the apron and I just walked over to the window and thought I'd just wave at her. And she looked at me real quick, stood up and she waved at me like, like a gorilla was waving from a zoo. And so I was like really uncomfortable. And so I was like, okay, so, you know, there's, there's that impression that, um, uh, you know, you were kind of in a bubble at that point. Next slide, please. So there was a couple of impacts and, you know, from the community and it, by and large, it was hugely positive. There's an outpouring of gratitude. You know, we got, um, I blew my diet. There's a lot of food that was deposited at the fire station. We had actually had a, um, had to kind of develop a policy ad hoc to limit the food. We had a press release where please don't drop food at the fire station unless you coordinate it through our ELC because part of it was uh, we didn't know where the food was coming from. Also, it was, it was going to make me fat too. <laughs> so, so a uh, little side joke there. So, but, so there's huge positive outpouring from the community. However, there were some negative aspects. Again, keep in mind this is. Uh, the incipient stage of the event. So there was a lot of unknowns for the community as well. So for example, I, I say social distancing early, but basically what it is is all members in our department had plans with people and we had a social life. You all of a sudden got uh, phone contact from people you never met or from people that you may have like contacted earlier uh, stating like, hey, are you contagious? Did you test positive? They asked a lot of invasive personal questions. They also asked for me personally, I actually live in a small community just north of Seattle on an island. And I was the first, it was very well known that a Kirkland responder was in isolation and quarantine that's from Woodby Island. The only, the only problem is that I'm the only Kirkland responder that lives on Woodby Island. And so yeah, eventually like my, my public health test, my uh, COVID test, when I eventually got tested, became public and became public information, even though, uh, it seemed to me at that time to be private. And, you know, it was, it was kind of an invasion, I felt like an invasion of privacy. So I kind of had to recognize in my head, again, this is an incipient stage of this event, that it's okay for me to share my test results. And, and my first test, both tests that I've had so far have been negative. Uh, that, hey, I'm just gonna share with you that I am negative so you feel better. But I'd also remind people that, hey, this is at this point a private health record. So I just throw that out there because, you know, there was a lot of fear in the community from me being in the community with my kids being in school. And again, we have, I live in a small town. So there was a lot of uh, challenges, a lot of gossip uh, about me that was really frankly kind of uncomfortable, but something I had to kind of deal with. Next slide, please. So, but what's kind of, I, I don't want to say neat about this event is, um, my fire department, you know, like most fire departments, sometimes we're kind of slow to change, but this has actually been uh, a time in the history of my department where we've changed rapidly and changed uh, very um, proactively. And so we did, we've done a lot of steps and efforts to kind of mitigate the one, our uh, part to mitigate the spread of the COVID virus. We, after the Lakeview Gardens event, or excuse me, Life Care Center, it used to be Lakeview Gardens, 
they we uh, wanted to do our part to minimize the spread of the COVID virus. We modified our apparatus, our A cars were vis clean or shelter um, are sealed off so that the patient compartment was was sealed away from the front of the compartment. We created and you see in the bottom right hand corner a, a dedicated decon station, or we call it we call it the COVID car wash. And basically, it's a parking lot just outside the hospital that we typically transport to that has decontamination equipment that's folk more focused on, uh, you know, de disinfecting the whole body of the A car or ambulance. Our hazmat team and made available to all all ambulance companies and fire farms that that transport to the hospital. Uh, we also implemented a policy of a station warm zone. So. You see here, and it's kind of hard to tell. You see some coat racks and some some barrier tape. We actually roped off or, or taped off the um, the inside of the bay so that only you can only go in there with your duty boots. And once you cross that threshold, you have to change shoes. And uh, we're, so we're wearing Crocs inside the fire stations or sandals in the living spaces right now. They're kind of a conservative black Croc, but basically. Uh, we wear two different pairs of shoes inside the fire station. So in the living space, we're treating it just like uh, turnout gear. We don't live in, with our living spaces with our bunker gear. Uh, our duty form, we're not wearing our um, in the living space as well. So we we strip down. So we, and actually, we're wearing coveralls right now to respond to calls. Uh, also, we're definitely focusing on a lot of uh, testing, both for responder health and uh, mobile tests. You know, you see in the middle picture. Uh, we have a mobile testing site that's just dedicated to first responders in the near area. Next slide, please. So I just want to thank you. Here's my email address. There's some other uh, pictures of some uh, uh, features around the fire station. We have self-test stations, which I'm sure a lot of places do. Uh, foot baths, which, you know, so if when we move around the fire station, we're constantly bathing our shoes to make sure that uh, they're disinfected. Uh, and then we also contain our compartment compartmentation inside our eight cars. One of the things, and I didn't mention it before, is uh, we implemented a scout protocol for assessing a patient. So our first goal is to get the patient to the door. That chair, that fold-up chair that we you see in that middle picture, we actually take that with us and have people move to the outside of the house so that they have something to sit on. And most, uh, about 70% uh, of our aid calls that we respond to were having everybody move to the outside of the house unless they're incapable of doing so. And then we have send one person in there to try to move them to the outside of the house. Uh, anyway, thank you for your time. I sure appreciate it. And uh, let me know if you have any questions. Hey, uh, Chris, this is Chief Ludwig. Quick question, I'm looking at this foot bath and I've seen a lot of innovative stuff done and best practices through this whole thing, but I haven't seen the foot bath yet. What is in there, water or some type of disinfectant or what? What do you? what is inside that foot bath for our it's, listeners? <laughs> It's a disinfectant, I, and I, I have to look. It, there's a mixture, and I have to read it every time I do it. So I can't tell you the exact mixture, but definitely disinfectant. And it's a rubberized um, floor mat that's got like a, a well or a tub. And so basically, you just we just change it every couple of days. You put your foot in it, scrub it around a little bit, and then use that foot mat, the um, door mat next to it to kind of dry it off. And then we take our boots off after that. So, so I so I understand you're stepping in with your boots. Is that what you're doing? Yes. Okay. Your fire boots or your work boots? Our work boots. All boots. Okay. Yeah, if they got a steel toe, they're going in there. Okay. Did you also say you're using other type of footwear like Crocs or something like that? Yes. Inside the fire season, if you see in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see those pylons. If you go past those pylons, you're wearing another type of shoe, whether it's, um, you know, the, the department's been, we're a pretty buttoned-up department usually, and we like to wear a uniform while, but with this event, they lightened up the uh, uniform wear, if you will. So we're either wearing tennis shoes or Crocs or um, other alternative uniforms in, in the living space of the fire station. Okay, very good. That's a great presentation and we appreciate it. And uh, we're happy to hear that all, that all the personnel there are doing well, including yourself. So Thank you. um, again, very valuable information. Uh, you were the first fire department we started hearing about in the nation with the uh, response to all this and the impact. So again, uh, kudos to all you guys for handling the job well. Thanks. Uh, we do have our economic chair back with us. That's Steve uh, Pegram. And Steve's gonna join us by phone as I understand. And 
So, um, so if you want to unmute Steve, and we're going to turn the floor to Steve, and he can update us on the economic component. Steve, can you hear me? Steve, are you there? Like we're still having some technical difficulties. Um, and I think a lot of us are experiencing this during this time period. A lot of bandwidth is challenged. A lot of people on the internet, a lot of people on their cell phones. Um, Steve, I'm going to try you again. Are you there? I can see you, but I can't hear you. Maybe back at our IFC studios, they can somehow loop you in. We're gonna try it one more time. Steve, you there? Steve, uh, back in the, the studios there, are you uh, are you gonna be able to lock, loop him in? Uh, hi, Chief Ludwig. I'm trying. I made him a presenter and he's unmuted, but we're not hearing him. Okay. We'll give it a little bit more, um, but I, I'll, um, I'll give it a little bit more and then I'll just kind of give a cursory overview on the economic side of things. And I think I know what some of the things Steve was gonna talk about. So we'll give it a little bit more and we'll see if Steve can join us. All right, I think he dropped off. So I'm gonna go ahead and just update our listening audience. Uh, basically, uh, one of the things that we're asking everyone to do is go to the IFC's website, uh, and uh, again, it's ifc.org backslash COVID-19, and there's a survey there survey there that deals with the economic impact to your department. We're asking everyone to fill that out. We can go to Congress and ask for $5 billion for SAFER and $5 billion for AFG, and we, we have to have data to support that. That was a cursory number that we came up with, a 30,000-foot view just from us impacting or just from us putting the survey out, the impact we see is actually going to probably be much worse than five billion and safe from five billion AFG. Uh, I think what I saw this morning already is that we're already with about one percent of fire departments reporting, we're already looking at over four hundred million, four hundred and fifty million somewhere in there of economic impact of a loss to fire departments. And if you were to parlay that out to all the fire departments in the United States, you know, you're probably talking thirty five, forty billion dollars in losses, uh, the economic loss to fire departments that will have less funding. So uh, we need you to go there and fill out that survey. We need you to put in that data so that we can have some good information that when we speak to our representatives, as we did the last two weeks, that we're able to provide that information to them. We, uh, again, uh, please go to, to the IFC's website and fill out that economic data. Some of the other things I think Steve is gonna talk to you about, and I think Ken kind of hit on it, is that the AFG, uh, grant the $100 million from the AFG, which will be used for the PPE, should be out soon. One of the things we've asked for is a blanket waiver, uh, which is, again, I think that's going to happen. And uh, our, and if not, I, th I believe that's going to happen on that one. The other ones that are out, um, the safer, oops, sorry, got a fire in my community here. Um, so the important part is, um, Again, uh, we are uh, working on all that, and um, and so we continue to work on that. As Ken said, I, I think Ken LaSalle, I see you still online. I think uh, we've had a host of phone calls over the last week by a conference call with, uh, I think, at least six different Senate and House Appropriations Committees. We've spoken with the FEMA Administrator, the National Governors Association, White House staff, um, other secretaries and assistant secretaries at the Department of Homeland Security a whole host of people as we try again to talk about the narrative of how the fire service is being impacted by this with PPE and also economic impact to us operationally and economically. And so we will continue to do that. And I remind everyone that we are uh, doing a call to arms and I'm asking you to please contact your uh, senators and representatives in Congress and please tell them we need this additional federal funding not to save 
uh, not to increase jobs, but to save the existing jobs we have. We're not trying to increase the number of firefighters, but we're also trying to save the current levels of staffing that we do have. The volunteer fire service has been dramatically impacted by this also. They have been unable to fundraise. We have the more senior volunteer firefighters who might have pre-existing health conditions who are unable to respond. The list that goes on and on how we have been impacted operation economically. And so it is so imperative and so important that Congress help us by funding in the next stimulus bill, $5 billion for AFG and $5 billion for SAFER. We need you to go to the IFC's Legislative Action Center and please send a message to your senators and to your U.S. Congress people, uh, your representatives in the U.S. House, and tell them about this funding need. With that, I want to say thank you to all the panelists today who provided terrific and outstanding information. I also want to thank Chief uh, Sinclair, Steve Pegram, and Chief Jenkins, who are all chairing different tasks, task forces for me. Finally, I want to thank our interim CEO, Rob Brown, and all the members of the IFC staff who are working very long hours and weekends on behalf of our members and the entire fire service. For those of you who are listening today, if you have any questions, please email COVID19TF at IFC.org with any of your questions. Again, that's COVID19TF at IAFC.org. As a reminder, we will be doing these webinars every Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll also include economic information from our task force in the future. In order to register for these webinars in the future, please go to IAFC.org. Again, I'm always honored to serve in this noble profession with so many outstanding people who make a difference in their communities every day. Please join us on our future webinars. Uh, one will be again next week at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time as we provide the latest updates and vital information. In the meantime, everyone, please stay safe. God bless you, and may God bless these United States of America.